All right, I think maybe we should um, begin in a sec. Um, Um, Jaddy, do you want to come through? Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll start in a sec. I think there's a couple of new uh, people still joining. Cool. Brilliant. We're here. Um, all right. Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to this conversation today between Alex Gartenfeldt and Jade Fadajitami. Um, I'm really happy that so many of you have been able to join us today. We're very lucky to have Alex and Jade um, that they're able to come together today and I'm sure it's gonna be a really fascinating discussion. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction to, um, to them both. Um, Alex Gartenfeldt is the artistic director at the ICA Miami. In this role, he has curated many projects, including surveys for Terry Atkins, Thomas Baylor, Larry Bell, Judy Chicago, Shannon Ebner, Paolo Nazareth, Sterling Ruby, Ettore Sostas, and Andra Osata, among many others. He co-organized the first showing of major early works by Donald Judd and a spotlight on late works by Senga Nagudi. Forthcoming solo exhibitions are for the work of Geneva Ellis, Harmony Kareen, Michelle Mayeris and Hugh Hayden. And Gartenfeld was the co-curator of Songs for Sabotage, which was the 2018 New Museum Triennial. So yeah, thank you for joining us today, Alex. And moving on to Jade. Jade Fadigitimi is a London-based artist. She holds a BA from the Slade School of Fine Art and an MA from the Royal College. Um, Pippi Holdsworth Gallery, that's us, we presented her first solo exhibition in 2017 and this was followed by a solo institutional exhibition at Pier London in early 2019. Um, following her second solo exhibition, which is just closed at the gallery here, Gesture, and I, I think Jade and Alex might speak about this a little, um, Jade has solo exhibitions next year at the Hepworth Wakefield and the ICA Miami. She will also be included in the 2021 Liverpool Biennial. Um, and Jelly is currently the youngest artist to have work in the Tate's collection. Her work is also held by the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Walker Art Center, and of course, the ICA Miami. Um, so yeah, great. Thank you both for being here today. I think um, Jelly and Alex are gonna speak for roughly about 40 minutes and then there will be time for questions. Um, if anybody does want to ask questions, please feel free to just pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll come, to, and we'll come to them at the end and hopefully get through as many as possible. Um, great, so I think that's everything from me and um, yeah, let's hand over to Jade and Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, thanks also, I guess, first and foremost to Pippi as well as to Poppy and the whole gallery for putting this together and uh, all the support that you provided to myself and I think to Jade uh, as we've been starting to work on a few projects. Um, I am one of the few people probably on this whole Art Basel OVR who is in Miami. Uh, and I mentioned that one because I hope that we can welcome you next year and we'll be working on an exhibition of Jade's work, uh, which we can talk about and which will comprise uh, new works. We're very proud to be able to support Jade's work, uh, her extraordinary work in painting, um, through our collection as well as our exhibitions. It's working with artists who are at crucial points of their career is something that's really super significant to us and very meaningful. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing how this exhibition unholds, or unfolds. Um, last reason I mentioned Miami is because we have a work of Jade's from our collection on view now. And it is, for those of you who are there, it is a really beautiful, lush painting. Um, that we acquired about a year ago, and I hope we'll have the opportunity, you know, to talk about it a little bit as well. But first and foremost, Jade, thank you for being with us. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Catherine did, I think, a really good handoff, which was about your exhibition gesture, which was more than slightly impacted by the quarantine. 
Um, and I think that this is one of the first opportunities that you'll have to speak about it. Um, this was a suite of, I think, what, six largely paintings that you made for the gallery. Um, I think a really kind of amazing step uh, in your practice. One place among many that I'd want to begin is you know, I think your titles are so fascinating and specifically the word gesture. Um, I brought up, I guess, a lot of things in this introduction, but one of the places where I would ask you to start is um, specifically with that title um, and the J that you used uh, to begin the word. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, and yeah, the title gesture for me was really symbolic of the physicality of making the work as well as the thought process behind putting out a show during a sensitive time like this as well as <clears throat> um as well as um kind of highlighting i'd say the absurdity of of this simultaneous um realities of making work and being here during a pandemic being here during um, more emotional times, especially. And so for that show, I started, um, um, I started involving pastel in my work, as some people might know, and just the physicality of using the hand, um, the directly into the paintings with drawing in with pastel or oil sticks or however you want to refer to them, um, felt like a gesture in itself from myself directly to the paintings and having that conversation with them. And then and then also, I guess it's a layered title in the sense that, you know, the gesture of putting on a show during a time like this as well, what I was kind of questioning that through the title. Um, and then as well, um, I, I like a bit of humor. Um, <laughs> and I feel like um, the whole thing felt a bit ridiculous, a bit absurd, a bit funny. And it, I was making, um, before the show, before that uh, hunger show, I had made a couple of works and there was a painting um, that had kind of started this whole, um, had started this whole body of work with the paintings themselves, including pastel. And it made sense for me to call that painting gesture. So there's a painting actually that exists that is called gesture. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, t I'm, I think one of the many people who unfortunately only saw the work online, uh, which I, uh, looked, you know, as I said, really stunning and took on a number, like I think a new color palette, for instance. Um, but I think also one of the things that we don't get from seeing your work online is a sense of scale. And you've talked about your works previously as environments and because this was such a peculiar time to be making work and to be describing environments, I wonder how that unfolded for you kind of as a physical experience of making the paintings? Uh, that's interesting, actually, because I feel, I think, especially because, you know, I started these paintings during our lockdown, and I always describe myself making these paintings during lockdown. But I have to admit, my lockdown, personally, I think in the UK, our lockdown was from March till um, July, but my personal lockdown was from March until September. Um, I think I experience a lockdown in some ways whenever I'm making a show. And so in the run up to the show, the way I'd been living was the same as we had been during the lockdown. And it's quite interesting to make paintings in a time where I couldn't travel as much, where I couldn't see as much um, in terms of distance away from the space that I'm used to um, and kind of bring the outside world in, in a way. But that outside world was more entangled with my imagination. And one of the wonderful things I found from during my lockdown or our lockdown was how expansive my imagination had become in a way, because I was seeing, even though my days felt more monotonous in a sense, they also were absorbing a lot more information and translating them differently and also translating an idea of nostalgia. Um, <clears throat> and so in terms of scale, I f it was, fascinating to make works in a scale that I could in a sense if I wanted to in a dream world walk into them in a time where I couldn't actually go much further than the radius between my home and my studio um, 
yeah i think did that answer your question <laughs> I mean, yeah, absolutely and i think also kind of pointed to a few really important themes in your work um the first i think that i'll one of the first things you mentioned was that this was the first time that you used oil stick or pastels in your work and i have to say as somebody who's thinking about your work that actually surprised me just because this kind of imbrication of color and, and line is is so crucial to kind of what is so fascinating about your work but i wonder kind of why now what brought you to um this new medium format um it's a mixture of things i'd say First of all, I am definitely the type of person to obsess over one thing for a very long time. And I do feel like I've been obsessing over Liquin since I started Slade, the Slade in 2011. Um, but at the same time, at the beginning of the lockdown, from I think for the whole of March, I didn't go to my studio. And I decided I was going to stay. It wasn't a decision. It was more out of fear. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> that I was going to stay at home and and make work from home. And the room I'm in right now is kind of my makeshift home office that I did up during the lockdown. And I really wanted to make, but I didn't, I didn't know how to translate that making to a space where there's no door so my cats can come in wherever. I'm sure maybe you guys can hear one launching away under the table. <laughs> but um, yeah, where I could... Uh, make work practically as well and <clears throat> I was I would be in all day and I'd be drawing but I think the involvement of the pastels came because um, a while ago I did a project with um, I think it's oh goodness uh, gosh UN women's art movement mm -hmm. I might be getting the title of that slightly mixed muddled up but in order to make this fabric piece um, I had used pastel on tracing paper um, to kind of figure out how to layer on top. Um, and so I had pastels lying around, but I'd use them for one singular purpose and kind of push them to the side quite naturally. And then whilst I was here every day, they were sit sitting in front of me and I just started to pick them up. And once I started to pick them up, I really enjoyed the movement of them, the back and forth. It was a lot of script, I wouldn't say scribbling, but the motion of using the pastel. I now, I now look at it retrospectively as it was also really soothing for probably a lot of anxiety that came with the unknowns of this pandemic, especially right at the start. Um, but then once I started and I got, I enjoyed it, I didn't enjoy picking up just my coloring pencils or just my markers. And so I started ordering these sets of um, pastels. I think you get 200 in the whole set. And they became a way for me to also invite colour into the work because I had this direct access to colour visually in front of me, which I could just pick up. Um, yeah. And I know that your studio practice is, you know, the centrepiece of what you do and has a, what you've described as kind of dance-like element. Um, to the way that you paint, create, move around the studio. I wonder, you know, if, if the pastel has impacted that dance or if you had a different sort of type of approach, um, you know, given that new material. Um, I think it has, definitely. I think I'm still learning about it every day. I think the gesture as a show was the start of my engagement with the material and I'm using it now and learning more about different ways. I think the way it impacted the kind of physicality with making my paintings is how often they break. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm one that takes, I don't get upset if my pastel breaks in the middle of painting, but it definitely does take, you know, an open way of thinking to think, okay, how do I get around this? And how do I, yeah, how do I approach this? So I feel like I definitely found myself you know, bending down more often <laughs> to pick up the pastels. But actually what was really exciting was once I started working with a particular type of oil pastel and I was finding, okay, these pastels aren't as strong, I started looking into more different types of pigment sticks um, in general. And um, yeah, I guess they connect me quite closely with the work in a different way. I'm more with my face to the canvas when I'm working. Yeah. And I mean, because we're in your studio and aside from your, your 
cat behind you, we also have a selection of drawings. Um, never having seen your your works on paper exhibited, aside from I think the edition that you were mentioning, um, how does you know a drawing practice factor into these paintings, which I think also have this very important process of instantaneous drawing to them? Um, they 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 operate in so many different ways for me. One of them is I see them just like I keep my, you know, I have a thing for sofas. So I have quite a few sofas in the studio. I love dolls. I love plants. I love fabrics. So there's clothes, there's rugs. And those things operate in the studio in the same way my drawings do. I look at them in the moment of painting. All my, my eyes catch them quite naturally. And so I will have a reaction and that reaction can involve itself in the work I'm making in that moment. So my drawings for me, it can be notes for the paintings, but they don't, they're not, they're not made with the purpose to create a work. And they're also um, wonderful exercises of thought, um, of thought, sorry. And they become, yeah, a tutor at RCA, Philip Allen, he, he was the one that really got me into drawing. I was so, against drawing for a long time because I was such an intuitive painter or oh, that's how I used to describe myself so I'd always go straight into a painting um, but he he made me think of drawing differently as when you can't when you don't have the urge to get up and paint draw and if you can't draw find a way to draw that is the most comfortable for you and mm -hmm. I think I discovered that um, with my journey with my work so yeah they play different roles for me and just in terms of because you mentioned a little bit your education. Um, have you always um, drawn in this style or at all? Or, you know, what brought you to, um, what brought you to painting, particularly painting kind of in the abstract figurative vein that you do? Um, I wouldn't say, I'm hesitant to use the word style because I, I prefer language. I think style is quite, um, yeah, I think you operate within a style and your language has the, the power to grow and evolve over time. And I think my language, the timing of when I started drawing was the same timing of when I went to Japan for the first time. And these works started with the beginning of the story for these, this whole, my whole career in a way, actually. And, um, and I think that language of my drawings, my drawings definitely started up my relationship with my paintings. They made 30 drawings at the end of my time in Kyoto. And they had a, they were the beginning of this language. And then they informed my paintings. And I think so for the, maybe for the past three years, I've been working with this language and it has been growing and changing a lot. And, you know, travel you've mentioned is such a big part of your, your practice, which may be surprising to some audiences who see your work as purely abstract, for, for instance, that there would be kind of an observational and personal quality in the images. Um, I bring that up just because I know that your work, your, the next actually, next project that you're working on is for Takeishi, and I think it's your first real exhibition in Japan. Um, one that I think perhaps, unfortunately, you may not be able to go to uh, although I think maybe the jury is out. <laughs> um, but I wonder how that contention as well as that context are, is informing kind of the, the work that you're thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I think living is a big part of my work. I have to live in order to work. And I don't mean that in a literal sense. I mean, my life flows into my work a lot. And travel, tra for me, travel started mainly with Japan. And then as I've um, gotten a lot more opportunities. I found myself going to many different places, Cologne quite often because I have a gallery there, Gisela Capitan, as well as, you know, I've been to Italy a few times um, and then I go away with my parents. And I think that when I engage with something, it happens so naturally and so instinctively that I find myself taking photos a lot um, or wanting to buy something because it it has resonated with me in some way or form. And I think my travel has really helped me collect a lot of realizations about myself and the things that I'm drawn to. Um, now that it's gone, it's, it hasn't necessarily or gone f or temporarily stopped. It hasn't necessarily actually changed my like engagement with my work in a sense. I'm not looking for tools to use. It's just 
my scope of sight has narrowed, but it's I've definitely absorbed a lot more information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and Japan as a place has always been extremely important to me. It kind of, it started my relationship with myself through my animations, through my animations, through Japanese animation. Um, and Are you going to ask about the animation? <laughs> <I've never seen. laughs> um, and, um, and so I used to go to Japan specifically, you know, once a year in, for my work. Once I went the first time for my exchange um, for a longer, longer period of time, I had seen its effect on me and I wanted to return to it quite often. Um, and now I go, well, before Corona, I was going three times a year, but for shorter periods of time, because having a gallery there changed my relationship with the place as well. Um, but yeah, travel, travel. I think I travel through my paintings too. I think you can travel within yourself too. You don't need to literally leave your home to travel. I, I think I have many forms of travel for myself. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about some of the works recently, and I know that not all the visitors um, or all the viewers that we have now are necessarily have the images in front of, of them, but I'm thinking of, for instance, uh, from your last show with Pippi, uh, the image birthday, death day, which strikes me as particularly restrained in its composition, but also quite floral and quite symbolic in a way. And, you know, as you're talking about time or place or memory, perhaps we could hone in on that painting in particular, um, or any other, if you don't want to talk about that one. <laughs> I mean, we can talk about it. I'm surprised you picked that one. I'm really happy you picked that oh, one. Oh, yeah? Why yeah. are you surprised? <laughs> well, I'm not surprised. And I say I'm excited more because that painting is so different from the rest of that body of work, if, we're, mm -hmm. if it is a body of work. Um, and I feel it is one of the most simple, more simple. I wouldn't say simple. I say there's less... Um, less busy paintings mm -hmm. in terms of formal elements. Um, but the title of that painting, I really enjoy a lot. And I remember when I, I can't remember who I told that title to and, it, <laughs> and I was like, oh, um, that's a harsh title. But I, I love the title of that painting um, in particular because I, I'm not sure if I, how, how, I'm not sure how to start going into it. I think there are definitely parallels to the experience of this pan pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we want to let it be as open as possible. But at the same time, I remember, you know, this pandemic actually started just after my birthday. Um, so I celebrated in London and I had to celebrate in Cologne and I got back home and we were in lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, so it has a personal relationship with me and I was saying to someone the other day that it's quite interesting. I turned 27 and now I'm soon going to be 28 and I don't really feel like I even experienced my age. Um, but in terms of the like second half of the title, like, you know, death day, I wouldn't, it's, I, I actually see that title as quite positive mm -hmm. uh, because I think that it's, it's interesting to only draw connections to birth. And I think, I at least feel like I'm constantly being reborn through, you know, my own self realizations. And it's kind of trying to highlight a really wonderful, like recycle within myself or, um, and in this moment. And I think that might, and I think it's also, I think where I'm going with this ultimately is that I don't want to be insensitive to also people's struggles right now as well. And I think the flip between two states um, is quite, beautiful in that title and in that work and yeah. for the work itself and when you look at the work it was it was an association with that painting um once it was finished oh i think i titled that actually in the middle yeah, yeah. well it is i mean not to be simplistic it is a sort of spring-like painting almost like there is like, like a blossoming kind of element to it um aside from a restraint like a more kind of muted very kind of open color palette on the flip side, sort of more or less, because I would say that in the show, it struck me that there are a few techniques that you're using compositionally, This, because there are a few more kind of restrained, or at least the word symbolic kind of um, 
but there's also um, a kind of a net like quality which you use in in a number of your paintings veils voids i guess one of the things that i i mean I guess struck me first about see, when i saw your work was you know how persuasive you create a kind of experience using an all over form of the net and that drew me to the painting in particular a obsession which is you spelled out <laughs> or obsession, <laughs> which is a fuller painting, sort of, a, I mean, um, it almost feels like elements of it are trickling down the canvas, but it has a kind of all over um, quality to it. Um, perhaps you could walk us through that title among other elements of the painting, because I guess I also just thought, you know, there is this kind of, um, you know, har vacui sounds like a kind of a negative word, but there is, that's not how I mean it, but there is a kind of such a fullness to a lot of your compositions as well. Uh, yeah, I think that um, that painting, the title really um, kind of translates my relationship to making that painting. I think that painting, although, you know, I have a certain pace with my works just because of the way I think, um, I did spend a lot longer with that painting than most paintings that were in the show. And, and um, I think what I find when I'm really excited by a work or a particular moment in the work, um, I like to embrace it fully. And so that net you're talking about, if I'm translating you cor correctly, um, is, 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 <laughs> is more, I would say it's more of an episode of fascination um, that happens with, I feel like each painting has its own net in that sense, but um, <clears throat> I don't know whether to talk more about the painting or the title, because I think the painting as a physical painting in terms of colour, in terms of, I was thinking a lot about colour theory, or let's switch that around. I think that ma whilst making that painting, I was reminded a lot about colour theory. Um, and, you know, how to play with someone's eyes, play with my eyes, to be honest with you. Um, I always like to disrupt myself and, and obsess over certain moments. And in this particular painting, it was interweaving color, interweaving, um, veils, interweaving until it became so chaotic that you, you couldn't focus on one element without getting distracted to another by another. And I love painting like that. And I do it for myself more than anything. Um, it's, it, I feel like a lot of my paintings are having these moments, especially of these like colored dots, um, where they, where I've noticed how they react, how they change your relationship with your eyes when looking at the work. Um, and I think it's something I've noticed when I look around my spaces, like there'll be pockets of color mm -hmm. And I can't stop engage. I keep engaging with it because it's there. It's like when you leave, I don't know, I was going to give you an analogy. When you're leaving a museum and there's a painting that you really don't want to leave, but you have to leave because you've got to get somewhere to be and you keep looking back and forth at it. I feel like these pockets of color do that for me. Um, and that painting obsession has these, I remember orange circles yes. at the tips that are meant to like steal your eye, but then you go back in a lot. Yeah. Now those really actually, it's interesting. I mean, th those two kind of uh, uh, red dots in the middle of the composition struck me as rather unique in your work because they seem, your work, which probably most people, and especially myself who experienced most of the vast majority of your work online, there is a, a, a very material quality to your work. Um, fields of transparency and opacity, um, there is, actually sometimes a thickness to the material. And I'm just talking about the one painting that we have on view, right, you know, at the museum. Um, but it struck me that this, you know, your, your work is so immediate. These two dots, just as one kind of example, seemed like an episode that came later, which seemed somewhat of an, anom an anomaly um, in your painting process. The two dots in the center, I actually have to say, were there in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. And, the, when I'm painting, I try, I, it's not even a, an attempt to, I think you, I love to listen to my paintings. Sometimes you can see forms evolving and 
you just have to embrace them. And I think those two dots were embracing, were me embracing something I had seen in the painting mm -hmm. that probably most people wouldn't see. And I'm not here, I'm not going to say what it is to me because I believe the works are a space, they, they should remain open visually. Um, and, <clears throat> um, but I think it might, yeah. Oh gosh, I'm struggling because I don't like to give too much away about the work if I don't think it's important for the viewer. Uh, so I might have to just retract on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, without asking you too much, there's a, I mean, there are so many really evocative titles um, in this exhibition. And I mean, I actually like to go painting first, title last, I think is, the, but um, this one I mentioned in particular, just because um, it's entitled, Thank You, My Love, I Would Never Have Discovered It Without You. and it is also, um, to my eyes, a diptych. And so I wanted to seem like there was a kind of a symmetry between the title and the painting that might not exist in other works. And it really stuck out to me as well. Um, yeah, I'm getting shy now. <laughs> um. <laughs> You can make it up. It's about gesture and performance anyway. I, I mean, I, I'm going to be completely honest about that um, work because um, I fell in love this year and a lot of love has gone into myself and the paintings and the person I'm in love with. And and that painting was really is really special to me. Um, it is a hybrid in the sense that I started it just before the pandemic and I completed it during the pandemic mm -hmm. and um and the um there's this pillow in um i don't want to say the person's name because i don't i don't want to publicly <laughs> but um there was this pillow i was in doing facetimes a lot with the person i love and there was this wonderful pillow um behind his head constantly and i was obsessed with this pillow and it was really the start of this painting and that um, painting was a painting of gratitude to this person and the life they've given me and and also it taught me a lot about love and there was a lot of love whilst painting that work um, in general. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm getting embarrassed because I don't usually share my personal life, but I think it, I think it's interesting to watch the story, well, because I know my own story, to watch my story through my works as well. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave that there. No, that's, I think that's <laughs> generous and congratulations. Uh, <laughs> I, there's another, you know, I'm actually this, I mentioned this not in order to tease out information from you, but there's another, but rather to point to something, which is um, there's another uh, painting that is called all my muscles have pillows, which seems evocative of the same spirit. But I guess what it points to me is that, um, or points out to me is that writing or poetry is clearly such a big part of, of how you consider and conceive of your paintings. And that kind of begs the question, is there a companioning, a companion writing process? And how does that come into this spontaneous, quasi spontaneous production of kind of, um, of your painting? Um, yes, there is. I, I write just in the same way that I decide a next mark on the canvas. It is a reaction to thought. And um, my life, I will often put down my paint, paintbrush to suddenly write down something I've realized or heard in my own head. And mm -hmm. And yeah, they happen simultaneously and I've been doing it for a while and I really enjoy it. It's interesting to see how the paintings and the writings kind of evolve together. Um, but something interesting that I think that happened during lockdown, which is relevant to all my muscles have pillows is I noticed that maybe it's something to do with speaking to people less or seeing people less. I felt like my inner mon monologue had become external, even in speaking. So I found myself starting to note down things I was saying out loud um, as, and collecting these quotes. And one of those was, all my muscles have pillows. Um, and my partner was also noticing the, the, my like external writing. So I also started recording myself a lot more because I found that actually I was starting to speak a lot more 
as well as write. I still write the sending out, but I guess I'm speaking to myself a lot. I think I've started speaking to myself a lot more. Um, <laughs> um, but the writings, I don't even know if I call them poetry or I call them thought. I think I, I definitely think the way I write. Um, I'm definitely quite the romantic. Um, and I also have these collection of messages for myself, for the work, for other people that gather in my head that I just need to express. So sometimes they can enter the paintings as well and sometimes they just remain within my notebooks or on my phone. Do you think of these writings um, in a kind of authentically personal or diaristic sense or as a construct of your work that kind of lives in companion to, to you and your, your everyday life? I would say, that's an interesting question. I would say the writings for me are, operate, can, op can operate the same way as the paintings. They exist as themselves, mm -hmm. um, but they inform each other, that's for sure, because I inform each of those and I create both of them. If that's, yeah, we're all connected. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna stop that. <laughs> It's all good, and I have uh, actually pushed you in a perhaps an overly kind of personal direction in terms of interpreting the work because I, you know, your work is so open. I think what's one of the kind of real accomplishments of, of the work to date is, you know, how open and how communicative it is in so many directions. You mentioned color theory, which intrigued me just because I, I've never heard you necessarily speak about it before, and I would actually be interested in following that line, but I guess just in the opposite direction, perhaps, of, of poetry and, and love is, you know, your paintings invoke also, uh, in a, perhaps a remote way, networks, um, and you've spoken about communication, but also uh, inevitably technology. And I wonder of those kind of buffet of references I just laid out, is there any that feels particularly kind of true to you? Is there, sorry, what was the last part? Does this kind of reference to, to networks or to, I'd say the impact of technology on you and your everyday life, does that ring true in terms of how you think about making your work? You know, I, I, I don't know what generation I technically am or whether this is just singular to me, but I'm, for some, I'm not that involved in tech, Technology is not something I necessarily associate with myself too much because I dip my toes in, but then I dip them out and I go and do something else and I dip my toes back in. They're a way for me to access the information and my like soundtracks and my animation, but I'm not sure how much it has informed me. But, oh gosh, I was going to say something based on what you're saying. And Oh yeah, um, but one thing I am interested in when you said networks is conversations. And I think conversations are really important. Um, I have conversations all the time through my work with myself. And I've noticed how having conversations feels ideas, but also, you know, connects us with people, connects us with ourselves, connects us with our environments. I think there's so many different ways to converse than literally having a conversation with the person in front of, in front of you. And, I'm always thinking about how my works converse with each other as well as myself, but also I've been thinking a lot, um, especially during the lockdown about how, how we have our own, how we kind of define ourselves in, in the ideas we have or the morals we have, um, but we don't necessarily think about the conversations that have gotten us there. And so every time I'm titling something, every time I'm painting something, I'm always questioning why. I'm always questioning um, I don't think there's a limit to how deep you can question something. Um, and it's really interesting what it unravels. And I feel like for me, that's how my work communicates with me and I hopefully the world because world, I feel like I've just got a bit grand there, um, <laughs> with other people. Um, because I think that, um, I want, I'm, I'm trying to embrace that message myself even more and more. I've noticed how indulging in myself in a way has only made me want to spread and you know spread hmm so maybe spread's not the right right word um there's a quote i have that i think is um oh 
I love to sw- I love to sweat or I love to swell. I want love to push past my bre- belly in order for it to spread. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's all to do with connection. I think with my paintings, I'm extending branches to myself and other people, and I and I hope they can become spaces for people to have a thought, whatever that might be, and then to carry that thought. Maybe that's a grand idea. Maybe that's a grand message. Maybe in a few years, I'll, I'll be having different conversations with myself. But right now, that's where my thought process is at. Well, I think it's a really striking kind of binary in your work that your work is so immersive and can be kind of an environment into itself, unto itself. But inevitably, um, context is important. And you live in London, your studio's in Bermondsey. Um, you've recently had some changes to your studio. We were speaking yesterday. I, I don't know necessarily how publicly you even want to necessarily share this, but you shared it with me, which is that you, this idea of a conversation is becoming a part of, of your studio practice and interdisciplinarity and the point at which your paintings reach the world is becoming more important to you. Is that something you'd want to elaborate on or is it too soon? Um, you know, I will say as much as I know at this moment because everything's so early. Um, but the story of the studio was actually even interesting to, well, to me at least. But, um, you know, we were, before the show, before the pandemic, sorry, we were working with the idea that the show with Pippi was going to be in June. And I was working on some ideas and it required me to have a delivery of something. And we couldn't store it in our studio. We had two spaces in a shared studio block. And I, and I started to realize, you know what, I've been thinking in my plan, at some point I will change two years, but maybe it'll be in two to three years. Um, but suddenly we had to start storing things in a storage um, outside. And I was like, well, this doesn't make sense. If I'm having to pay for out, you know, external storage, then maybe we should start looking. So I had a meeting with my team. And I was like, okay, you know, in a two to three months, we're going to get a new studio. Uh, we're going to start looking, we're going to start thinking about what it is we want, but forgetting what kind of person I am, which is very spontaneous. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I had a little cheeky Google. I was like, oh, but let's see what kind of things are available. And I stumbled across this space, which I mo- I've moved into now, which is uh, 3,000 square feet five times the size of my last space and I and all of a sudden we're in the midst of this build project whilst I'm making making the show for Taka and having other commitments and um, it's become a one and and the space has also inspired me and inspired us as a team as well because I've been talking a lot about conversation um, and as the space is growing I'm, I'm noticing things about myself I'm noticing how how the aspect of creating environments isn't singular to my painting. I, it exists around me and it's really exciting to be working with a new space that I can do almost anything to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're tiling it, we put wooden floors in, um, it's still going, maybe it'll finish in March, I doubt it, I keep adding things to the project. Um, but one thing that was really wonderful is that I've always wanted to, you know, I've always wondered whether, you know, the conversation that we're having, for example, the conversation that, um, or that I have through my work with people that go to see it, whether it is something that is only access- accessible through the moments that we speak, or I have a show, or, and I've always wondered if that's a shame, because when you talk about context as well, I think that painting has given me a lot of lessons about myself, and I think that lessons that I found through painting are not singular to that context. Um, and so I've, I've wanted to kind of figure out an, a way to use the space as a space of culture um, and a space of, I don't know, conversation, a space of love. Um, or maybe I've become really spiritual through this pandemic. <laughs> um, and work with younger people, work, have internship programs. It's just ideas and ideas piling on top of each other, but in a way that translates my, my being and what energy I want to spread in a way. And it's so, it's so, it's, su- it's such um, a young idea in a way. 
Um, but I've wanted to do it from the first moment that I started teaching. I wanted to connect more with students. I wanted to connect more with people with disabilities. I want to, I just want to, I don't know, give in some way. Um, if, if that is something that interests people and if, if I am someone that people want to connect to, but sometimes I wonder about the exclusive, the exclusive, yeah, the exclusivity, yeah, okay, we know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> of, um, of access to the artist's mind in a way. Um, and because I, I actually feel like a lot of the thoughts I've had about my work and my relationship with it has come with the people, my friends, conversations with them, meeting random people when I am traveling, meeting. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I'm gonna stop. No, good. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you one like, kind of last, uh, almost obligatory um, question before we turn over to, to the audience for a few questions, which is, um, you are a, a young person on the cusp of millennial and Gen Z, I guess I was, <laughs> <laughs> um, despite your, your, your um, ambivalence about technology. Um, but I wonder in that spirit, if there are any, you know, painterly or other heroes that you have, or um, I think what your work is, you know, so is very full of reference, although quite original in itself. And it's clear, I mean, from your conversation today and all the conversations you have that, painting is so central to your vocabulary and your language and your mm -hmm. life. So I wonder who, you know, if there are, um, you know, any kind of figures that you're thinking about on a regular basis. Um, okay, I will be repetitive, but I'm also going to add on because I did think of some more. Because I do, I do, I always get asked this question and I obsess over things so you know my favorite artist is still is still Mickey Kukulo and Laura Owens is really dear to my heart as a journey especially as a student um but also I remember when I went to the Tate and I got obsessed with Sigma Polka because of how different every work was and you know when I'm at the Tate Britain I love to look at a bit of Sargent and David Hockney and Matisse as well um just as some I think that um, the way I look at art is a bit like how I find my music in the sense that I can like just one song, but I might not like the whole artist. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure there are more pockets than that. But even at school, I loved Phoebe Unler's work and she was a she is a still true to there. Um, and, and then I've also, I had, I remember I had a phase, it's not a phase, I still love, um, Nara Yoshitomo as well, um, but I could I could probably list forever, to be honest. I've always I think the polka reference is really fascinating to me. I've always and never not asked you before, but I've always uh, one reference, uh, and I wonder how you feel about it. Is I've always thought of kind of Charlene Bell Hiles work a little bit, um, for some of the reasons that you mentioned other artists' work, which is kind of a resistance to signature in some of the works. Also, I, when I sometimes the way that kind of voids or fields appear in the work. And I wonder if she, um, certainly a painter that I admire very much, is somebody who you've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I wouldn't say a lot of time compared to the others, but it's interesting you mentioned that because I do have quite a few Shannon Vaughan and Hal books in my studio. Um, and I definitely have looked at her and I do love her work a lot. And I definitely, when I started working with Gisela Capitan, um, I had more access to the things she'd done and saw her work more often. Um, and I really, I really do think that things can enter you abstractly. I might not sit there with books and books on her reading, but she, she's within my memory a hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think that's it for my questions. Jade, thank you. First of all, it's always awkward to do a clap snap, but thank you <laughs> so much for always for your generosity and for your commitment to creating dialogue around your work. Really, thank you and such a pleasure. Oh, thank you for having me. It was, it was fun talking. Um, Catherine, if you don't mind, um, I see some questions in the q and A. I I myself don't necessarily know how to cool. handle that. So, I'm gonna... <laughs> so I'll start with the first one, but if anybody else wants to, um, you know, type any more questions in, we can get to some more questions as well. 
Um, the first one, well, first, the question for the time being is, um, would you ever consider applying your poems into your painting? Um, I guess that could be interpreted in a few ways, um, but yeah. Um, I think they already are, but abstractly, I don't, yeah. I think that there is that communication. I think language can translate into painting through painting. It doesn't need to be um, visibly present as language, if that makes sense, yeah. Um, and actually, well, I don't know if anybody else, we've only had one question so far. So if anybody else wants to type one in. Um, oh, um, we just, well, just one, um, hang on one second. Sorry, and in terms of transcripts and so on, that kind of thing, um, we, this video is being recorded. So we will, um, if anyone missed anything or their internet quality wasn't perfect, that will be resolved later. Um, one second, just questions coming through. Oh yeah. So um, what is it about paint particularly that excites you compared to other disciplines? Um, I would say, gosh, I'm going to be a bit softy about it. I think paint ev evokes so much character. Um, I definitely envy the material. I remember that's what got me so excited about it. I think it's way of translating colour, but engaging with its physicality of it. Um, and the sense, the lack of control, I, I honestly love that paint really does its own thing. Even if I'm making a painting, also probably the way that I paint means that I embrace a lack of control. Um, but it's amazing how you can see a painting of something and you can be sitting next to the same scenery, but that painting will kind of evoke something in you. And I, it's definitely a um, romantic relationship with the material. Um, yeah, I've always, I strike my paintings a lot too. I just, I still think I'm understanding my relationship with the material, but yeah, paint is sexy. Paint is definitely very sexy to me. Yeah. Great. Um... Then we have another question um, saying someone loves the colour of your wall and wondered if you could speak more about why you've uh, chosen that particular colour. Um, um, that's a good, I mean, I've chosen, I choose, I chose my wall colour like I would if I was deciding to make a drawing or it's intuitive. I love Farrow and Ball a lot as a paint. <laughs> as a paint company so when I was thinking of what colours to paint the house um, I went through the list and I picked the colours that drew to me the most but also I thought a lot about the space as well and there's a garden um, there's like a door next to me with my garden and a window where you can see the garden too and it was a relationship between this pink and the like purple tree outside and the, yeah basically it's part of a whole painting um, as a scene. Um, um, someone else has a question that is um, about, I suppose, about sort of being a painter and um, being in the sort of commercial art world and how do you strike a balance between painting for yourself and also making paintings for exhibitions and then to sell? Oh wow, you know what, I feel very lucky because when I started, um, I'm just going to mute my computer, that doesn't make sense. When I started um, making, when I started, I've always made work for myself, basically. I feel like I've always made works that I've really enjoyed. I'm so sorry about the dinging. Um, and I would say that one thing that I felt I, has been a real luxury in a sense, especially as an artist that does work with commercial galleries, is that um, because I started making work like this um, and people fell in, my, were in love with my work for it being the way it is, I've never had to separate my work into two pools of personal and for exhibitions I don't know if that's true for all artists I hope it's I hope I hope most artists feel like they're making work that is purely for themselves and that that is the thing that all is purely them and that is the thing that 
attracts um, outwardly. But yeah, I if I think the only way it affects me in a sense is that I have deadlines in a sense. But at the same time, I've always enjoyed deadlines. I set personal deadlines for myself. I just I think I'm a bit of an obsessive worker anyway. So yeah, yeah, I think I answered that question. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Um, so I think we'll have just one more question. Um, so the question is, is there a specific animation that's had a visual impact on your work? Um, and, you know, if not, maybe you could speak more broadly about, you know, that kind of relationship and how um, sort of definitive or how, what, what that sort of relationship consists of. Um, okay. Specific animation is difficult, but I can list animations that I remember off the top of my head um, that I have looked at more than others just because I'm, but it's never just the visuals. It's also the stories. It's also the music. Um, it's everything together. Um, but uh, one is Mishishi. Um, another one would be, oh gosh, no Japanese titles, Yolai in April. Um, another one is um, uh, Our New World, I think it's called. I, I could keep listing. Um, but also, oh gosh, yeah, there's so many, there's so many. Um, no, I'll stop there because I think that, I hope someone asks me that question in another talk and I'll be prepared, definitely. Um, <laughs> Great. Um, well, I think that's all we have time for today, but um, that was a really wonderful conversation. And I don't know, I feel like we could have kept listening for quite a lot long, longer. So um, yeah, it's a shame that we, we have to end. Um, but I'm excited that I suppose it will continue in a form because there's the exhibition next year. Um, and obviously the relationship with Alex and the ICA will continue. So um, I encourage everyone to look out for that towards the end of next year. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, and also make sure you take a look at Jade's new painting on, on our Basel booth. Um, so thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jade. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week, whatever time it is for you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Catherine. Thanks, Jade. <laughs> uh, see you later. <laughs> see you. Bye bye.